I'm Genevieve Randall. Glad to have you here on this pre-concert chat with Lincoln Symphony Orchestra. I am music director with Nebraska Public Media, and we are so pleased to support Lincoln Symphony Orchestra with these pre-concert chats. You know, some LSO concerts are broadcast on our statewide network, network on our occasional series, Nebraska Concerts. So we're uh, even more happy to be talking with Lincoln Symphony Orchestra. And I've got a couple of guests here, as you can see, at Polichick, of course, the music director for Lincoln Symphony Orchestra, and Anton Miller, who gets to not only be principal violinist, as he usually is, but he also gets to be a soloist on this concert. Anton, Ed, great to see you. Great, so to, great be. to be here. <laughs> Excellent. So some folks are probably watching this well ahead of concert time. For some folks, the concert is tonight. We'll just have to not worry about what time it is because you never know when you put these out ahead on the internet. But for those who uh, don't know about it yet, if you found this somehow, the concert is Friday, November 3rd, 7.30 at the Lead Center, and it is featuring Vivaldi's Four Seasons, which I want to get to a little bit later. Okay, yeah, Anton's like, yes. <laughs> yes, he wants to get going already. <laughs> This is cool. This is all Baroque. We've got Vivaldi, we've got Bach, we've got Handel. So if we could maybe chat a little bit backwards through the program, we'll save the Vivaldi for dessert in our chat. And then it'll be like the first thing on the concert for people who are watching live. The Handel, I mean, it says epic here in the description for, <laughs> for the concert, but music for the Royal Fireworks is just, first of all, the music is great. But second of all, the stories that go along with the history yes. piece, yes. please. And it was like celebrating the signature of something. And all of this, there's all of this around just somebody signing a piece of paper. That's kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Tell, tell us a little bit about this piece, Ed, from your point. Well, I do love this piece. I think it is great music. Um, it had a very bizarre beginning when, uh, I mean, Handel really... Uh, gained uh, the, 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 the notoriety and the, the, the blessings of the royalty in England when he had moved from Italy. Uh, and he became, the, I think, the very first master of the king's or queen's music, uh, which was a, a, has always to this day been a very prestigious title. And King George II had requested that Handel write music for the Royal Fireworks, which is, of course is an outdoor thing, uh, an outdoor event. Um, and uh, Handel had in his mind to make it one of the larger orchestral uh, pieces that he had written, which included strings. And the King said, absolutely not. I want only big, sounding instruments that can make a lot of noise, that can compete with the fireworks. And so Handel's uh, once said after his meeting with the king that um, the king has asked me to write a piece for the royal fireworks and it's with all these weapon weaponry instruments, it was anything that's loud. And I think the very first performance included 16 uh, oboes, 12 contrabassoons, serpents, uh, of all kinds of percussion, trumpets, I'm not sure how many, and uh, the trombones and the serpent type instruments, sackbuts, uh, I don't know how many there were there, but it must have made quite a statement. Right. Um, then later on, he actually rewrote it for with strings and, and, and pared down the uh, 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 wind and he brass. rewrote it and wrote it the best way because it had strings. Because it had strings. Had no idea what was good. Leaving Spoken the light like... up? Kidding me? Who does that? <laughs> I have to. I have to say though, just to like you know define a couple of things for anybody who's listening to you say the word sackbutt and wondering what's going on, Ed, or or serpent, for example, because you've got yourself an early music nerd right here. That's and right. It's funny when I saw, I didn't actually know this bit about all the double reeds at first to be used as weaponry. We all know, Anton, that strings are much more peaceful, even though some people have t-shirts that say, stop the violins, but. Right. <laughs> uh, oh, 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 got it, got it. <laughs> 
in before the baroque period even instruments like the serpent which is like half woodwind half brass it's got a brass exactly mouth. bizarre sham the sham which has a double um, reed that is a weapon in and of itself go look up <laughs> the sham and somebody playing it because it's uh, plug your ears first i mean they are kind of used as weaponry so i thought oh this is really funny that that's what he chose that's what he chose i loved it i just absolutely loved it the, the the point being that um, it it leaves it's one of the very few pieces within the Baroque period that leaves itself very much open to interpretation and in a sense what you want to use you if you you I mean if you want to be very correct about it then you should go back to the old instruments um, the predecessors of the bassoon the predecessors of the trombones and the trumpet and the, all of that stuff. You can you can use the modern instruments, um, but then you can also use combinations thereof. And Charles McCarris, who I've, I've always been a huge fan of, I find him somewhat of an iconic musician, not just a great conductor, but he's he's a really great musician. He made an arrangement, and it's this it's his version which we are will be presenting, which is actually for full modern orchestra including clarinets which weren't even invented at the time so um but but it it does offer i think a unique way of experiencing this music on a much grander level because you will, we will go in in the evening from the only strings only and of course continua i will be at the harpsichord um to um strings along with oboes bassoons um, and three trumpets and timpani to then kind of the full disclosure of what uh, Baroque music can be all about. I love this program. I think it's going to be just spectacular. Absolutely. It's so, so cool. And we get the three biggies here of, of right. the Baroque era, right? Three and, giants of the Baroque, right? And make sure that we get to Anton and his um, Four Seasons spotlight here. We, we got to go back here to Bach, who, by the way, fun fact, um, was a huge fan of Vivaldi. So I think it's cool that he's tying together this program in the middle. And this is the orchestral suite number four. Um, I not, not done very often, actually. Yeah, yeah. It, okay. it's, it's, it, it may be, the one, four and one might be the least performed. Two is very, very popular because it's just flute and strings. But three then opened it up into what we call the celebratory orchestration of the Baroque, which... Um, always includes oboes, um, bassoons, strings, but must have three trumpets and timpani. So whenever you see three trumpets and timpani, especially in Bach, you know it's gonna be very celebratory. Um, this was written at a period in Bach's uh, time when he was in Curtin, and um, he did mostly instrumental writing. Um, the Brandenburg and Charity come from this period, the solo violin and cello suites. Um, it, was, it was actually a time when Bach seemed to be his most happy because he just loved uh, not being uh, saddled with the, uh, I guess you would call the religious calendar of the Lutheran church. And every Sunday this had to happen in this theme and these were what was allowed and this was what was not allowed. He had great freedom of expression. And you can feel this actually in this piece. Um, we have done the third orchestral suite before, which includes the same orchestration, but I thought let's now do number four and show this aspect of Bach with the three trumpets, timpani, oboes, bassoons, and strings. It is a glorious piece and in a typical kind of structure of a suite. So you open with the overture itself, and then you go through minuet one and minuet two and the bourree and the minuet and the blah, 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 blah. And we close with the la jouie, uh, réjouissance. Um, and it's just absolutely fat, incredibly um, intricate. Um, and in some ways, I have to say, um, and I feel this way a lot about Bach, in some ways, extremely romantic, very beautifully romantic. So this brings me to a question I, I, I want to lead with Anton here on this one and then go to you, Ed, because I think it's interesting to think about that sound. But since we've got three Baroque greats here, this is kind of like the musical version of describing a wine 
Anton. Yes. Yes. How, how would you describe the flavors differently of these three Baroque era composers? Oh my goodness, that's a really interesting question. Um, exactly. I, you know, and I'm glad you got that question, Anton. Well, so so it's, it's interesting. Like like think about if we think about kind of the relationship, you know, musically, um, as you said, Genevieve, about um, Vivaldi and Bach, and the fact that Bach was a big fan of Vivaldi's, and I think there's you know, the, the Vivaldi had that way of really showcasing um, the violin and, 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 and solo instruments. Like you think about um, yes. how he, I mean, he's, he's kind of, I, I sort of see him as like the father of like the concerto for instruments and showing off the instruments and all that. And he even wrote concertos for instruments that hadn't had concertos written for them before. So he was, he was a real trailblazer that way. And then his output is just tremendous. I, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of concertos, and they're all good. Like they're they're all really good. Like it's it's amazing. So four hundred and thirty-eight you know, like, concerti. Well, so so it's a lot, right? And 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 yeah. and, and, and they're, <laughs> and, they're re, and they're really great. So I think you know then then you look at at uh, and and I think there's there's a real sort of connection that Vivaldi found. So it's it's like almost like a, an every man's kind of person that composer and so i think it's you know kind of if we're if we're talking about wine it's like the best two buck chuck you could ever find and it's not it's not like a, a label wine right it's it's like it's like it's everybody want it's like oh my god we can just this is for people we can just drink this stuff we're not we don't have to go to a hoity-toity you know wine bar and have this one it's like it's down and dirty it's so cool it's just like everybody's gonna enjoy it right so, exactly. Exactly. So, so, <laughs> see, I, mean, I got you on that one. Okay. So, so, so then the then like Bach is this thing where I feel like um, again talk about an output. I just I can't imagine in one person's life to have written all of those things. I mean, it's just it's just it, it's mind blowing. But the depth and the um, um, just the, the the skill with which. Bach wrote the, the part writing just on its own, just to be able to write in that way that everything, I mean, nobody wrote like that. Nobody, and I don't think anybody since had figured out how, how does it happen so naturally? Like he could do all those things and intricate sort of voice leadings and all those that stuff. And it's and it sounds perfect. And it's it's exactly what you want to hear. It gives you the satisfaction of being intellectual, yet just really going to your heart. So there's a depth to that. So I think, you know, a really wonderful Cabernet Sauvignon, maybe. Um, and, um, and then I would say, I would say that, um, you know, for Handel is like, there's, there's this sort of, again, for, for me, when I, when I think Handel, I think that what Ed was talking about, that there's this sort of like, you know, interest in, in kind of um, the, the the celebratory things and the kind of like you know there's all this sort of grand kind of like show and 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 I feel like you know if 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 Handel was around today um, he'd be writing you know musical theater things and and like just stuff for for and again very popular composer right so I think we're we're then going into a, a, another thing like as as Vivaldi did um, that there's this you know music for people to really um, to, for people to love and to really be entertained by and, and music Just for events. Celebrate, celebrating and, and effervescence and, and reaching all the, the gamut of emotions. I, I agree. Oh, so, so champagne. Yes, the effervescence. I was thinking it has to be sparkling. <laughs> <laughs> so how is that? <laughs> Bravo, Anton. I see Bravo. you. Bravo. <laughs> great. Yes, exactly. And I think it's perfect because we got, I, I said wine because wines are so different, but it's this, they're all wine. They're all Baroque composers, right? To carry a metaphor, probably a little too far, but it's fine. Um, but, you know, there are these different flavors and different kinds of feels to each of these composers. So I think it's really cool to have this all on the same concert. Okay, Anton, what was the very first time you ever heard any of the Four Seasons by Vivaldi? I was I was a kid. I was really young and I loved it. Like I was I, I probably was like seven or eight years old and just couldn't couldn't believe that like somebody had written something like that. Um, and I was thinking about it and I've I first probably performed Four Seasons when um, I was probably um, might have been 20, a little maybe even a little bit younger. And 
since then, I've played it, I think I've played it in seven different states and um, on two different continents. <laughs> and, I've, and I've played various versions that were based, you know, other composers that, that did their four seasons like Piazzolla and, and, and you know, that kind of thing. I've played, you know, various versions four seasons i think you know just just to say about the four seasons um before we move on it it really is iconic it really is one of the pieces of music that if you if you think about when it was written and what he and and what he actually put into that piece and how he conceived of that piece it's just i mean i i think uh, my understanding is that that was it, there were there were people that of course liked it but i think there were people that just said this is not what music is supposed to be you're not supposed to be imitating birds and dogs and dancing and this and that i mean it's it's just incredible what he did in you know in the in the early 1700s was 18 1720 i mean he's he's writing this and this is you know something that, that that's programmatic that he has text that goes along with it. There's description and the music itself is incredibly descriptive. I just, that's just way ahead of his time. I mean, it we were talking really about later is. on when we're talking about, you know, 100, 150 years later, people were starting to think about doing stuff like that. And and I think, you know, the 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 fact that the test of time is, has been kind to the four seasons because it really is something, I think, I think it, my understanding is that it kind of, it was played a lot during that time and then it kind of like fell out of disfavor for whatever reason who knows why and then it kind of made a comeback and it's one of the most recorded pieces it's one of the most performed pieces and every time i play it i'm amazed at how much i love it that piece there's never anything to get tired of in that piece there's always something for for everyone there's always something interesting to say with it but just the fact that to think about him writing that and having that uh, way back then and then to still one of the most beloved pieces that's performed i mean i there's 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 nobody in the universe that wouldn't like that piece i can't, I can't imagine you can't be human and not like that piece it's so amazing when did either of you first learn about the sonnets written with it because i also remember hearing this as a kid and thinking wow this is different this is high energy and um, nerd fact, I used to blast it out of a stereo in my car driving around Holmes Lake in Lincoln, which my friends thought was hysterical. I mean, the few friends that I had because of that. So, but when did you know about the sonnets? Because it was later, once I started studying music for real, you know, I thought, oh, there's sonnets that go with this, which is really incredible. It's like, it's, I mean, there was tone painting before, but Vivaldi, you're right, Anton original kind of tone poem lead in or something what, what did it's, you those, 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 the words are actually in the score so when i when i first learned it it was the, the immediate that like it was wait a minute what what is this and of course it was an italian so like wait a minute there's i'm, I'm playing that's icy and we're slipping we're falling and you know the guy's drunk what's happening here are you kidding me and there's like there's dogs barking. Oh my God. Exactly. You know, it's like, it's, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And it's so funny because as you, as you play it, you just, it, it's, it, it, it's immediate. Like it just, it, that's what it sounds like. And so even if you didn't have the poetry, you would know exactly. It's, it's just as descriptive as words. Like you would be able but, to, uh, anybody would, would, would be able to tell if you played it for them, they would say, oh yeah, that's a bird. Oh yeah. That's, you know, that, 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 that's somebody that's slipping on ice. That sounds really icy. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Like it, it really describes. It's completely a, a musical description of 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 the of what the text is. And we have we actually have a PowerPoint that's going to be shown um, because it's there. There, we didn't know at first if it, where he got these sonnets, and that we finally decided that he probably was the one who wrote them, um, and he did. Put Put them in the score and that's that fascinated me because i thought my gosh this is kind of the very very first programmatic music that that ever written like you were saying anton that that is it, it's he was so far ahead of his time but we will show the audience uh line by line where those words appear in the score when he's playing at that very moment so you'll be able to make the connection that that Vivaldi had 
in mind when he wrote that music. And I think that that's a, that's a wonderful thing. It's, it's, it's another uh, uh, addition to uh, another level of, uh, of admiration and actually expectation of what the music is all about when you add that to it. And I'll tell you, 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 you nailed it, Anton, when you said, every time you play this piece, it's like playing it for the first time. I learned so much, it's, all, it's brand new. There, that I think is a real testimony to those geniuses that make those masterpieces, whether it's the Four Seasons, whether it's Handel's Messiah, whether it's Bach, St. Matthew Passion, et cetera, et cetera, Beethoven's Ninth Civic, that you never ever tire of them and you continually learn about the, the inner depths of that composer's soul by learning those pieces, by, by repeating those pieces over again. Now I have done this in seven states too, but one of my states was catatonic when I've done it before. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. I I only encourage puns like that. That's totally yeah. fine. <laughs> that's, that's really well, bad. We, we too really, much wine. <laughs> too much wine. That's right. <laughs> There's never too much wine. We really have like 10 seconds left here. And I would love to talk more about Vivaldi and Bach and Handel, but our pre-concert chat has come to a close. And for those who are watching this right ahead of the concert, it's time for you guys to get playing, I suppose. So I hope everybody has enjoyed this pre-concert chat. And I certainly know everybody will enjoy hearing Anton Miller featured on this set of amazing concertos by Antonio Vivaldi that we know as the Four Seasons. Each season represented with uh, the violin and the strings. You'll also hear that uh, Bach orchestral suite number four. And then we'll round things out with a bang with the music <laughs> of the Royal Fireworks. There we go. <laughs> All conducted by our maestro, Ed Politic. You guys, Ed, Anton, thank you so much. This is always so much fun. What a great place. Thank you. Thank you.